Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this virtual edition of Film Independent Presents, our year-round member uh, screening series. I'm Josh Welsh, I'm president of Film Independent. And before we get started um, with today's program, I wanna give a special shout out to some of Film Independent's um, most generous and loyal supporters. Um, first of all, thank you to our incredible lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Um, thank you to our virtual screening partner, Vision Media, without whom we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, our official media partner, the Los Angeles Times, and lastly, our promotional partner, KCRW. Thank you to all of you um, for your support year round, um, especially as, as we moved our programming online. Your support means so much. Um, I also wanna thank Focus Features um, as well. First and foremost, and as well, I wanna thank um, award-winning filmmaker, Spirit Award nominee, Don Porter, and photojournalist and master thrower of shade, Pete Souza, for being here today. Um, for anyone watching who's uh, perhaps new to Film Independent, I just briefly want to mention Film Independent. We're a film arts organization based in Los Angeles. We are a membership organization, open access. If you love film or you're a filmmaker, please uh, go to our website and join, become a member. Members vote on the winners of the Film Independent Spirit Awards, which will be happening next year on April the 24th, later than usual, um, but keeping our spot a day before the Oscars. And um, uh, just go to our website, you can learn a lot about what we do. So with that, um, Don and Pete, thank you so much for being here, for taking time to, to do yet another Zoom call. I suspect you've been doing a lot of them. Um, but let me start by saying, how I, I love the film. I found it so pleasurable to watch. It's a deeply, it's a moving film and just so enjoyable on so many levels, both the, the content and the, the filmic, the, the craft of it. Um, so my first question really, it's for both of you, is how, I, and I don't know the answers to it, is how did this project come together? I don't know if you had a pre-existing relationship or if you came together specifically on this project, but um, I, either one of you want to field that. Sure, I'll start. Um, first of all, thank you, Josh, for having us. Um, as a former Spirit Award nominee, like I know how A, cool it is and uh, important, but also this year is so tough that um, giving, you know, kind of amplifying these independent movies is so important and so difficult. So we really appreciate it. Um, I was just a fan of Pete's, you know, um, on social media, like, you know, two million other people. Um, and then uh, Jamie Lemons, uh, who's producing partners with Laura Dern, uh, and they were working with Evan Hayes, who produced Free Solo. Um, they kind of, I was at another like awards um, ceremony. I think it was the IDAs. And uh, you know how they have that outdoor like courtyard, it's all pretty. And it's mm -hmm. like the one time a year the documentary people get to go on the Paramount lot. So we really <laughs> like it and like the food is really good. So we're out there and it's like the trees are nice and it's the LA weather nice. And like Evan starts like coming towards me. I didn't know Evan at the time. So I thought he was trying to get around me. So I was like moving out of the way. And he's like, no, no, I want it. <laughs> I was like, okay, who's this stalker? Um, but uh, he, you know, said, I want to talk to you about a project, but it was like at a cocktail party. So it wasn't exactly the time to talk about a project. So um, I, uh, went to LA. I met up with with uh, Evan and Jamie and Laura, um, and then they said, "Well, can you meet Pete?" So Pete came uh, to a conference room in Los Angeles, and he just brings his laptop and he, you know, opens it and starts going. He does a kind of a version of the one man show he has, and he starts going through the pictures. And I just was like overcome like with what I was feeling seeing the pictures and um so that's you know when I was kind of sold on the project but I think Pete had been speaking with Jamie and Evan um and probably Laura for a bit before that so I'll let him tell you about that yeah so for me it was actually right right around a couple of years ago um <clears throat> Jamie and I had this mutual friend um Patrick Jordan who at the time was a, a co-manager of Brandy Carlisle, who's a, who's a friend of mine. So one day I get this email from Patrick saying, hey, this friend of mine wants to talk to you about this potential project. Can I link the two of you up? 
Um, and I was like, sure. So I get this email from Jamie and then fast forward to the next time I was in LA, um, I meet Jamie and Evan, they come to one of my presentations and they start, you know, <laughs> start, I guess, working on me about potentially doing this uh, project. So that's kind of how it started out. And then as, as Don said, later on, I came back to LA and met uh, Laura and, uh, and Don. And um, I have to say that it was a little intimidating doing, um, doing, doing my presentation in front of four people, because I was usually doing it in front of, you know, 800, 1000 people. So it was sort of more anonymous, if you will, like, you know, I'm up on stage, and there's people out in the audience. But suddenly, I'm in this little tiny conference room with just four people. And they keep interrupting me to ask me questions. And I was that like, was Evan. <laughs> it, it sort of put me like, like, I didn't feel I was, you know, projecting my presentation and in, in the in the effective way that I usually am. And in fact, I guess uh, they, they were affected uh, despite the, the circumstances. So Pete, I, I have a follow-up question for you on that, which is, I mean, you've been in the public eye for a long time and people have known who you are, but I'm curious what the experience was like for you becoming the subject of a, of a film and a photographer, as opposed to being the one doing the documenting. Was it, I mean, did, did it just come naturally to you? Were you uncomfortable no. in that role? <laughs> oh my gosh, he loved it. He loved it so much. <laughs> he was like, what do you need to do? <laughs> No, I, 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 you know, I was, was not, well, first of all, it took some convincing to uh, get me to agree to, to do this just because, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of in the public eye on social media, but I'm still kind of anonymous in, in a lot of ways. And so this meant giving up my anonymity. So, mm -hmm. you know, I had to, wanted to make sure that that I could get my wife on board because, you know, it just, it, it changes, it, it kind of changes things a little bit. And, um, and then, you know, it just, it, it's just a little uncomfortable to have the camera turned on you. I mean, not, mm -hmm. not to take away the great people that Don and, and that had working with her, um, the, the crew were, they, they were all great. And so it wasn't, it wasn't that it was just like, just the, I don't know, the, just being on the other side is just like kind of a weird dynamic for me. Yeah. Yeah. Don, you, I don't even know how you did this, but you have two films this year, of course, you have the John Lewis documentary and then, and then the Pete Souza documentary. And I'm sure they overlapped at some point. And I'm just, can you talk a bit about sort of how you navigated that? And, um, and, and I'm assuming both of the films, you were finishing them during some part of COVID and sort of talk a bit about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was kind of midway a little bit past that in John Lewis movie. And um, when I, you know, met up with, Evan, Jamie, and Laura, and uh, you know, I mean, the the secret to independent documentaries and filmmaking is that you really, it's very rare that you can do just one thing and you know, kind of keep everything going. So, it's not unusual to to have things overlap, but I don't usually have them overlap so quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, as soon as I saw Pete's pictures laid out the way that he did it, I was like. First of all, I really wanted to do it um, and, you know, felt like it was important. It wasn't just like another project. It was important and timely. But the second thing is um, I, I felt like the movies spoke to each other. You know, John Lewis is, was all about, I have a hard time with the past test. This was all about um, encouraging people to speak up when they see something wrong. And here, that's exactly what P is doing right now. And so it felt like just the perfect thing to segue into, even though they're different people and different. Um, so, so it was really, um, I was just kind of determined to figure it out. <laughs> 
So, um, but you know, I, I, and actually I worked with the same editor on both films, Jessica Congdon. So it's probably even harder for her. I mean, she got no break. She just is like, and then go on. So we were kind of, Jess and I work really well together. So we were like in a nice groove with John Lewis movie. Um, and we had basically finished shooting. We were in the edit. Mm -hmm. So I could pick up and go, you know, start to start to follow Pete. I mean, I think the harder thing with Pete's movie is I was very aware, um, I had a lot of reverence for the pictures. And so I wanted to figure out what was the right balance of kind of verite film and, and the pictures, you know, and, and the still images and how do you really celebrate the still image without undercutting it with the verite. So we spent a lot of time balancing that. Um, and then as far as COVID, uh, we were done with John Lewis movie in late November. So, um, so that was fine. Pete's movie, we were not done with. We had other interviews to set up. I wanted to spend a lot more time with him. <laughs> um, and we just couldn't, you know, everybody went into lockdown. Um, so we had to, to get creative. So, you know, this movie, uh, I'm proud of both movies. Um, I think that they, they really helped me express some things I'm feeling at this moment. But, um, you know, this movie will always be really special because we just had to get really creative about finishing it. And everybody, every producer, Jess, our assistant editor, our people were all over the place and everyone just, no one complained. They just, like, everyone really believes in this film. And so, you know, kind of just really laser focused um, mm -hmm. on getting it done. So I know we have a lot, probably a lot of filmmakers watching this. Could you talk a little bit more about how did you handle those, the things that you hadn't shot when you say you got creative? Were you able to get those shoots like working remotely or? How uh, we, got you, a couple. Uh, we got a couple. Um, so first thing we did is we tried zooming with Pete. So there's some zoom footage in there and that was like, okay. Um, then uh, we sent him a camera package, a black magic camera, and that was a lot better. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Pete's obviously knows his way around a camera. Um, so, you know, was able to figure out, you know, angles and lighting and all the rest of us. Our DP d set the uh, camera up, you know, as far as, as like all our settings. And mm -hmm. then we mailed that whole packet to Pete. And then I would Zoom with him and he would, we would do the interview. So we did a number that way. Um, and then for a couple of people, Samantha Power, she allowed us to have a crew in her house, but I was Zooming. And uh, she's in Cambridge, I'm close by. And I was like, should I? And she was like, let's just Zoom. So, <laughs> so we yeah. did that. So I've actually gotten pretty comfortable with the Zoom interview, um, you know, out of necessity, but um, we're doing it, you know, color correct. Uh, my friend Liz Garbus said, use the iPad, it, it will work. Um, it kind of worked, it was better than nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, for sound, I had uh, done the last several projects with Skywalker Sound. And I worked with the same mixer, Chris Barnett at Skywalker. And so he kind of set us up with the Apple 4 um, and he uploaded sequences. So it was almost like we were in the room, except that Chris is really fun to be in the room with. <laughs> so I really, I, of everything, I really missed the mix because going to Skywalker is fun. Yeah. And Chris just like takes a lot of care with the movie and he makes you feel like you're mixing Tron 3 or something. You know, it's like a little documentary and, you know, he puts my name on the door. Like yeah. literally that one time Trolls was next door and it was <laughs> roles and like you know my little film um so i miss that a lot uh but i also like chris is usually the first person to see the movie like so for my last like four or five projects like he really knows he's like oh i like this oh this is good you know, I know. so so that's what we did wow it's remarkable i mean it's it's interesting to hear the samantha power piece that was all that was beautifully shot i you know there's no sense of, uh, this is not a Zoom movie, right? It's visually yeah. really rich and yeah. 
looks gorgeous. Um, yeah. So congrats. Um, Pete, I, then I wanted to ask you, so one of, uh, I've known your work for a long time, I, you know, from the Obama years. And I remember the Christmas of 17, I think, my wife gave me your, the, the book, your book on the Obamas, um, which I think for me and for so many people, that was a profoundly moving book for people who were living through that moment, for many people, I would say. I mean, it, in a way that I think photography books maybe weren't, it wouldn't have been in another year, right? That it spoke to people in such a personal, emotional way. Um, but I wasn't familiar with your previous work and, and your background, so it was great to learn about. And specifically that you, um, previous to the Obamas, you had done similar work to the official photographer in the Reagan White House. And that's one of my favorite parts of the film is seeing that footage of you with the Reagans. And it is straight, I mean, to me, when I think of presidents who've known how to seen the value of photography in a real way, it's like, I don't know if you agree with this listing, but it would be the Kennedys, the Reagans, and the Obamas are the ones where it's like, there's a sense of that personal connection through photography and a sense of family. Um, and I'd, I'd love if you could just elaborate a bit on how did, how did that Reagan position come together for you? How long were you doing that? And did, and was it, did you have the same kind of access with the Reagans that you did with the Obamas? Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I came to the White House in the middle of Reagan's first term in uh, June of 83. So his chief photographer, Michael Evans, hired me to, to work under him. And then he left after the first term and they didn't replace him. So the second term, there was kind of like a rotation, we'd rotation behind the scenes, but it's, it's hard to do that, you know, where you don't have one person who is, you know, sort of doing everything. Mm -hmm. um, so my access was not nearly as good, but I do feel that I made some, some really good intimate behind the scenes pictures during the Reagan administration. It just wasn't on a daily basis, I would say. Um, and, and not to, not to sort of disagree with, with your premise about Kennedy's, Reagan's, Obama's, but I do think that the Reagan administration was more aware of the stagecraft for the TV networks. That mm -hmm. that was their that was their focus was trying to create this this backdrop to put him in. Uh, and so it was much more stage managed his presidency, I, I think, just the way mm -hmm. I looked at it. Which which didn't um, didn't mean that uh, I wasn't able to make some pictures behind the scenes, as I say. It's just that was not a high priority for them. Um, I have a, a question about a specific a set of photographs that you must have done hundreds or thousands of, but photos in the Oval Office. And I, I remember them in your book. I mean, they're these gorgeous photos of Obama sitting at the, de at the desk with, you know, looking at a piece of paper or, or facing the wall. There's, there's lots of different shots, but the that you know the way that you would get the light bouncing off something yeah. onto his face and you must have shot i'm assuming you shot reagan at that desk and then you shot obama at that desk so many times could you talk about as a photographer how you approach that to keep it fresh or i don't know just you know the, the repetition of that and finding like these you know rembrandt like images of of the light coming up and they're just gorgeous and moving photos well, I mean, the interesting thing about the old office was the, the, the light was different, there, different times of the day and different times of the year. So for me, <laughs> my favorite time of the year was when the leaves were off the trees, because that meant, you know, there was more sunlight uh, coming in to the old office. And then my favorite time of the day would, would, would be l late in the afternoon when there was that backlight that came in on the desk and you could, if things worked out right, you could, you know, re get re a reflection, as you say, off the papers or, or whatever. But, it, you know, it, it never, it didn't always come into place. Like, it, you know, you know, my job was not to like direct him in any way. It's just how things unfolded, I had to be ready for. Mm -hmm. So, 
certainly at those that time of the year, meaning in the winter, late afternoon, my sense of light was heightened by maybe today will be the day that all the elements will come together and you'll get that really cool picture. Mm -hmm. um, and then conversely, during the summer, when the sun is higher, the leaves are on the trees, the Oval Office is a lot flatter in terms of the lighting. And that made it challenging to try to, you know, still make pictures with whatever light happens to be available. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that sort of answers your question. Yeah, or... yeah, absolutely. And I, thought, I mean, the other angle on the Oval Office is when you would have, there's so many shots of, you know, a group of people in there for a meeting where you're not shooting towards the light from the window, but I guess it's flatter lighting, but the drama in the photo is in the, the physical postures of people, the looks on their faces, the, the who's in the room, whether it's men, women, people of color, like all of that is just, again, this, the sense of drama that you capture there is so remarkable. Well, I mean, I mean, and also uh, trying to incorporate, some, you know, some of the historic elements, whether it be, you know, the painting of George Washington, the painting of Abraham Lincoln, or, the, you know, he had the bust of MLK and, it, it, there's a picture in the film and in the book where I, I've got this picture where the bust is in the foreground and in, in the background, he's talking to these uh, activists that had protested in Ferguson after the events in Ferguson. And, you know, I tell people like, I, I, it took me five years to get that picture because the elements never came together. I was always aware of trying to make a picture like that, but it just never came together until that moment where just all the elements, you know, he happened to be standing in just the right place with these, these young adults, um, you know, and I've got the bust in the foreground and, and the painting of Lincoln. Um, so I was always aware of my surroundings and, and hopefully trying to incorporate those into my photography, but sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Mm -hmm. Don, um, you know, the, the word inspirational is so tired out and, and often just overused to, to the point of being meaningless. But I want to say I found the John Lewis film and this film like inspirational in a very real sense. And to watch them at this moment, right? I mean, there's, there are lots of different types of documentary film and there's, I mean, you've made other types of film earlier in your career, like films focused on particular issues that can be very like, you know, films dealing with, with, justice and racism and police brutality and the, the justice system, right? I and mean, there's all kinds of hard hitting documentary films that educate one and, and uh, you know, galvanize people. But I found your two films this year are so like in a, not a corny way, but in like a really important way, uplifting and inspiring. And I'm right. And, and there's an element of pleasure to that too, where I'm just like, you just want to bathe in these. It, it's, and this film in particular, I mean, it's inspiring. It's, it's a portrait of an artist, Pete, and his commitment to his craft. And, and, and it's also, of course, still a portrait of those eight years of the Obamas that's captured in the photographs. That's also inspiring. I'm just wondering, I don't know if you want to just talk about that. Do you think about that? What, like oh, this yeah. year when I you were approaching? Your... Yeah, 100%. I think about that quite a bit. Um, you know, what I think about a lot and what's, you know, uh, hang on, I'm going to call my son to be quiet. <laughs> um, there's like about to be inappropriate music in the background of your live stream. Um, you know, if you think about it, my film Gideon's Army, you know, made in 2010, my film Trapped made in 2013. Um, those were trying to shine a light on things that were happening while President Obama was president. Um, and, you know, for me, I felt like the government was in solid hands and there was a person in power and a government in power, you know, doing their best. And we needed to show them or show kind of everyone things that were not going well, you know, and, and it was kind of, it's almost for me, like I could take it. You know, I could really like dig into those tough subjects um, because, you know, the world wasn't falling apart like it is right now. And for this movie and for John Lewis movie, I think as an audience and me as a filmmaker and as a person, as a mother, as a wife, as a friend, I needed a different kind of movie. I need a kind of movie to make me believe 
And that's really what I was looking for in subjects because, you know, living under this president, I'm depressed enough, <laughs> you know, and which is not to say I don't read the newspaper and I don't keep up with things, but I feel like um, there are a lot of people like me who are just, we just need to be reminded that there's good in the world, there's good in government, um, and that things don't need to be this dark and that we can look towards the light and, you know, kind of live to work another day. So, um, so definitely it's the kind of movie I wanted to see myself, you know, I wanted to see something that was not Pollyanna and not, you know, um, false, but also was hopeful. Yeah. I mean, to me, one of the things that runs through this film in so many different layers is, is empathy. I mean, there's the empathy that you just feel it throughout the film. It's like the way that you're shooting Pete and talking to him and giving him space to talk about his craft, the way Pete, you filmed the Obamas and just seeing that in your relationship with that family and that administration and it's just manifest in your work. And then of course the empathy that the Obamas just embody, you know, for the country. It, it's like, I, I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but I just felt like there's just empathy running through this film on all these different levels. Um, I don't know if that's something that either or both of you have thought about or, um, and it feels like something, again, and not, this will sound to, some people might hear this as a partisan comment for me and I really don't mean it like that, but I feel like it's in such short supply, that sort of empathy and, you know, willingness to take somebody seriously and, and I don't know, you know, see their humanity. It's uh, Well, let me quote Michelle Obama for a second. Um, you know, Michelle said that the presidency doesn't change who you are, it reveals who you are. And, um, and I think that's true with my photographs too. I think behind the scenes photographs of a president can reveal who they are. And it, it just so happens that most presidents, including President Obama, um, th th they're empathetic. That's part of their character is being empathet empathetic and compassionate. And um, they know that the presidency is not about him. It's not the presidency is not about one person, it's about us. And when you contrast that with what we have today, you don't see empathy, you don't see compassion. You see an individual who cares about one person himself. Um, and like even today, he tweets out this offhanded comment about our people. And there is no, there is no like our people when you're the president of the United States every citizen, you represent every citizen in the country, and he still doesn't get that. And I think hopefully in this film and in my photography, you, you, you see what an empathetic and compassionate um, person Barack Obama is. Yeah. So Pete, that leads me to my next question, which is, a, a huge, and it's a big part of the film, is your decision to launch an Instagram account and, uh, you know, effectively start throwing shade at the current president, but through your posts. And it's, it marks a big shift for you as a photojournalist, where previously when you were in the White House taking pictures or, or working in news, you, your opinions were kept out of it. And now you're sharing your work in a new way where it's directly addressing current occupant of the White House. And um, I mean, this is a, a big part of the film. So people who are watching this, who've seen the film kind of know about this, but as a, as a follow-up question on that, was this something that you wrestled with for a long time before doing, or was it just obvious to you that you had to, you wanted to speak up in this way? I wouldn't say that I wrestled with it because, you know, I did a, my first shade post on January 21st, 2017. <laughs> so obviously I didn't wrestle with it that much. <laughs> but I will say that I was, I was, I was very subtle at first and, and tried to be humorous about it. Um, but, you know, to me right away, just because of the things I just talked about, I, I, I knew I had to speak out. Um, you know, and I thought, you know, I'm a private citizen now. 
And um, it, it, you know, to paraphrase Don's former subject, John Lewis, if you see something wrong, say something. And I couldn't just, I, you know, I couldn't sit home and not do, do anything. I had to do something. And I felt I came at it from a unique perspective, having worked for, for both a Republican and a Democratic president. Um, and, you know, and I, I thought I could, I could offer um, some uh, contrast maybe with uh with with what a normal presidency looks like and feels like and looks like um compared to what you know what we have today it's a really interesting uh i mean first of all your your posts on instagram do have so much humor um they're also in you're re reusing or repurposing photographs that you know some of us have already seen we're familiar with those photos but seeing them now in this totally new context where they're being directly juxtaposed to something happening in the news today with the current administration it's like it's bringing the photograph to life in a, in a really unexpected new way which I, I just I love it um, um, so one thing I noticed in the film there was footage of the transition between Obama and Trump, there was like, I saw, I remember seeing video footage and like you're, you're pointing out that moment when you noticed that the Secret Service was now following Trump rather than Obama. But I didn't see, did you get photos? Were you photographing in the White House like the day that Trump came to visit, like immediately after the election? Did you get shots of them together alone? Or was that kind of... Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, the, the only one we included in the film was... Uh... <laughs> it was a it was a, a picture where he uh, President Obama was given Trump a tour uh, of the you know Oval Office complex, if you will. And there's a picture, if you remember, where you you just see Trump's hand and his the back of his head looking into the private study. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I don't think I don't think I felt compelled. I don't think Don felt compelled that we needed to show photographs from that. Yeah. that day okay it was too sad <laughs> yeah i can only imagine um and so pete if, if now i mean you it is a big step for you to take to do what like what you're doing on instagram and yeah you're a private citizen and everybody can have an instagram account but does this uh i mean could you does it shift your career in a particular way does it limit you in ways like <laughs> Yeah, I think my career is over. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of winding down anyway. And um, uh, I, 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 again, I just felt that I, I couldn't, I could not say anything that I had to speak out. And if it, if it means that, you know, my photojournalism, photojournalism career is over, so be it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. There's still other types of photography I can do. Yeah. So we've got a ton of questions have come in from our audience and I'm just going to, I don't know if I'm going to, I doubt I'm going to get through them all, but let me just quickly go up here. Um, <laughs> can I answer the one about, I, I see the question. I, I, can I just answer the one about the Azorian community? My grandparents are from the Azores. So somebody asked about that. I have to tell you that last year I was at, I was in the Azores um, and there were so many reporters wanting to interview me. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and I, I created a few headlines, I think, in the Azores by <laughs> calling Trump a, um, a, a con man. And, uh, the next day's newspaper was like, uh, that I had called him a vigorista, which I guess is the <laughs> closest Portuguese word for a con man. <laughs> So going up to the top here, uh, I feel like you may have already answered this, but um, the first person says, my question, if Joe Biden is elected uh, and asks you to come back to be the White House photographer again, would you do it? Yeah, I'm holding out for a cabinet position instead. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that um, I'm, I'm of the age um, and, and the, the, this job just takes so much out of you that 
um, I, I don't think that I could do this job again because, um, you know, my family sacrificed enough for eight years where I didn't really get much of a personal life. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I have a granddaughter now and I want to spend some time with her. So I don't think it's in the cards for me. I will, I will say that I am going to do everything I can to make sure that whoever Joe Biden, knock on wood, uh, hires, that that person have the level of access that I had to President Obama. And I will be reaching out not only to the photographer, whoever that will be, uh, but I'll probably re- reach out to Joe Biden and, and um, you know, tell him yeah. the, import- the importance of having somebody make these images for history. You know, it's something you, you touch on towards the end of the film is the fact that uh, Trump doesn't really have a, right? He limits photography to someone to document official functions, but there, there isn't anybody sort of documenting behind the scenes what's happening. And on the one hand, that seems like obvious that he would approach it that way. But I'm just curious, were you at all surprised that he, like, given that he comes in some broad sense from media and should understand the value of images and, you know, the visual medium, to, were you at all well, I mean, I'll say, a, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. I, I have no, no inside knowledge about, you know, wh- whether the current White House photographer has the kind of access that I have or not. We don't, we're not seeing those pictures. Right. Um, what, what's, what's interesting, though, is that the, the current White House photo office has posted twi- more than twice as many pictures Mm. on Flickr than we did in all eight years. They've already sur- doubled our final total. But, you know, most of the pictures or 99.5% of them are, you know, from the reality show. It's just like, you know, the public events and um, you, don't, you don't really see the kind of behind the scenes photos. And whether, and, and I don't know, I have no inside knowledge whether that's because they don't have access or they're choosing not to post them. I don't know. One of the most amazing moments in the film for me was that contrast between the Trump photo in the situation room that seems totally staged and also has horrible lighting and just these like four or five guys facing forward versus what was happening. I don't know if it's in that same room or not, but the night of Osama bin Laden was killed and you see the Obama team arrange just the contrast of those two photographs is speaks volumes uh of photography and also of leadership and uh great to see that in in the film um uh another question has obama seen the film and if so his reactions or thoughts not sure so i mean i just emailed him on uh see today's monday i think on friday i sort of lose track on Thursday, Thursday or Friday, I, I was emailing with him. And um, he, you know, he was busy, you know, he's busy with his book and stuff, writing his book. And so I didn't want to uh, bother him. But, but I think he's going to see it. I can't remember if it's this week or next week. So he, as far as I know, he hasn't seen it yet, but he will see it, see it soon. A uh, question for Don on how you crafted this, the story arc in the film after reviewing all the footage um, and how and when did you decide that Pete should uh, narrate his own, uh, his own story? Um, you know, uh, I worked really closely with Jessica Condon, uh, the great editor, and um, we wanted, we, we had, we kind of identified our objectives. Um, you know, we had the benefit of being able to see the photos before we started, which usually you start shooting and then you see what you have. And here we had the opportunity to think, um, and, and actually the organization was somewhat inspired by a speech we heard Pete give, which is, you know, he talked about the qualities that you need in a presidency, you know, empathy, compassion, et cetera. Um, And so we kind of ran with those themes that Pete had laid out. And then we started um, the daunting, but really fun process of gathering, you know, our first pass at pictures. I mean, Pete took 2 million photographs um, there were tens of thousands that were kind of available for us to, to 
play with. Um, all credit goes to our junior editor, Ben Zweig. He spent uh, many happy weeks paging through photos, um, kind of guided by the themes that we were looking for. But we all have like our favorite images. And so everybody got their favorite image. Um, and then, you know, Jess and Ben and I really kind of narrowed down to, you know, kind of buckets of, of photos that we were really interested in. And then we brought Pete into that process and he, you know, he would see, you know, he didn't know what the film was going to be, but he could see what images we were gravitating towards. And then he was like, well, you should look at this one. You should look at this one. I mean, one thing I should say is Pete has an insane memory. I mean, he can pretty much that, that little bit with Trevor Noah, where Trevor says, do you have a picture for everything, you know, stupid Trump does? And he says, pretty much. Um, I mean, we saw that in real time. We would say wow. like, oh, we're looking for this. And Pete, you know, nine times out of 10 could point us, if not to the exact photo, to kind of, the moment in time where we should be looking. Um, so, mm -hmm. so it was, you know, it was a lot, but it was like a fun task. It was like mm -hmm. going through Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, you know, somebody's got to do it. Um, so yeah. it, we had a lot of fun doing that. That's great. Um, we have a question here from Marjan Safinia, um, who says, Dawn, this was such an incredible film, so powerful, it moved me deeply. That final thought from Ben Rose was so powerful. When you heard him say that, did you know that that would be your capper? Great um, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, Ben Rose is such a, a gifted, uh, he's such a gift with words, but um, more than that, he has such a sincere and deep um, interest in the well-being of this country. And so that is, I think, what he was really leaning into. And that is really how we felt. So um, we actually tried that comment a few places, but it was just such a good, you know, wrap up that um, I think it worked really well where it is. So thank you for noticing that. Uh, question for Pete. Uh, the image of Washington politics often seems fixed, but what have you seen change stylistically, aesthetically since your career began? Big question. Um, you know, and, and it, not really sure how to answer that other than um, I, I remember back in the, the Reagan days, there was a guy named Steve Crowley who was a still photographer first for the Washington Times and then the New York Times. And he, he would go to the same event as everybody else and make this picture that nobody else would see. He just had this intuitive sense of making a picture that really spoke to what was taking place more than anybody else. And, um, and, and there was nobody doing what he was doing. And now, like even in the Trump era, I mean, I follow many of the photographers that cover the, the White House on a regular basis. And there are so many great photographers that are really have their eye out for these little subtle details. You know, whether it be, I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't ever like the pictures on, on Instagram because they're of a subject that I detest, but right. they're just, they're brilliantly done. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think the, I think the, the, the number of photographers working the Washington scene have just gotten exponentially better. That's great to hear. Um, another question for you, Pete. Can you discuss how you review your own uh, personal editing style of your daily photo intake? And do you retouch things in Photoshop? With the volume of, uh, that's a great question, just given the volume of photos you were taking in the White House? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the only time I really got a chance to review my images was on um, more on a monthly basis where um, we, we, would, we would do a, a, a catalog of images from the previous month, behind the scenes images. And that would really be the only time that I would, ha that I would have a chance to actually go through my own 
pictures. In terms of retouching, the only thing we ever did was adjust um, uh, color balance and then uh, brightness and contrast. Uh, mm -hmm. So just basically following the accepted photojournalism practices. The one exception to that was uh, during the Bin Laden raid, that the, you know, the kind of iconic photo, there was a classified document on the table that we had to, uh, you know, blur out, pixelize. Um, but we, we, um, we uh, um, made sure that we were transparent about that we had done that. Mm -hmm. um, a related question, and I had the same question as I was watching the film, do you own the rights to the photos or does the White House or the US government, um, are you allowed to, what are you allowed yeah, to Yeah, so we, we, we uh, they're, they're considered public domain, so anybody can use them. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, in an editorial sense, I mean, the, the, the only restriction is like, for instance, if there was a picture of President Obama wearing an L.L. Bean jacket, L.L. Bean couldn't use that photograph, you know, to advertise because there's still uh, laws protecting the likeness of the president, even when he was the former president. So there's some, res there's some restrictions around that. But, mm -hmm. and I will say also too, that every single image that I made both in the Reagan and the Obama administration, every single image is archived and is now at the National Archives. Is it the archives? Okay, great. Yeah. You know, uh, I'll just add uh, quickly, I saw a question about where do we get the behind the scenes footage, um, yeah. really for Reagan, that was courtesy of the Reagan Library. And uh, it was really fun as a filmmaker to go back through that. But especially, I mean, you should have heard the shouts for joy when we found Pete with the mustache, um, Pete on the table, Pete, you know, uh, coaching Nancy and Ron, you know, when, when Reagan says, did you get that, Pete? You did. Yeah. I mean, it was just like made my year as a, as a filmmaker. So yeah, there's a lot, to, you know, there's a lot there if you look for it. Um, there's a lot around and and, ju and just to, to just just to sort of uh, I, I wouldn't say a differentiate but so each presidential library there, there's an aspect of it that attached to the National Archives so when Don says she got it from the Reagan library there's there, there's actually somebody from the National Archives that's administering the the archive of images and video that's housed at the Reagan Library. But it, the, the, the images themselves don't belong to the library, they belong to the National Archives. I mean, that's kind of a, sort of a splitting yeah. hairs, but. I love that scene when Reagan comes up with the idea of having Nancy hold the, the chainsaw. <laughs> I was like, this guy definitely comes from Hollywood. He's, yeah. right? Well. A great moment. <laughs> um, uh, somebody asked, Pete, you refer to making pictures rather than taking them. Is there a reason for that? Uh, I don't know. It's like, that's sort of an Ansel Adams thing, you know, and that, that's a quote from Ansel Adams that, you know, take a picture, you make a picture. Yeah. Um, I, I sometimes use it, in, I interchange those terms. Uh, and then in closing, a question for both of you, which many people here have asked, uh, what, this is a crazy question because you're just launching this film, but everybody wants to know what's next for both of you. Um, Don, to start with you, is two films in one year is not enough. Like, <laughs> are you starting work on a, a new project or developing something? Yeah, um, I'm uh, working on a six part series for Apple uh, with uh, Oprah Winfrey and Prince Harry. It's about mental health. So um, we're really excited about it. Um, they've both participated, they're very involved. You know, we have bi-weekly calls. So uh, it's, it's a totally different, <laughs> totally different kind of thing. Interesting. And Pete, how about you? Um, well, I think for me, it kind of depends on, on uh, what happens in the election, to be honest with right. you. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, hopefully I can close the chapter on uh, shade um, in uh, next January. 
Um, and then I still, you know, I still want to be active as a, as a photographer. And I also am interested in, in, in doing more uh, education. Um, it, I, I enjoy um, talking to young photographers and uh, want to, I don't want to do it on a, on a, like a permanent basis. Like I don't want to teach full time, but I do would like to, to continue to do workshops and, and lectures with uh, uh, geared towards uh, young photographers. You know, there's one other question here that I think is interesting. I want to ask from uh, Jeffrey Fenner, where he says, since the shade photos are a bit like Obama throwing shade himself, have you felt obligated to get his permission before posting any of them? Uh, no. Be and, and, and actually, I say that because um, I didn't want people to think that he was somehow in cahoots with me. You know what I mean? I didn't, yeah. I, didn't I, I, I thought it was important to, to, to keep that separation. Um, and, and he like, he's, he knew I was out, I was up to, I mean, you know, he has friends that look at Instagram. <laughs> I don't think he looks at Instagram himself. So, you know, he, I think he knows what I was up to, but it wasn't, I don't think he's like, you know, checking out Instagram every week or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want to thank both of you. I mean, first and foremost, thank you for this beautiful film. Uh, thank you for sharing it with the film independent community. And, and thank you so much for being here for this conversation. Um, these are crazy times and Don, anything film independent can do to, and Pete to, to help build the, the audience and word around this film, we want to, we want to help. Um, to anyone watching, um, please uh, spread the word, let people know that about this film. It is coming out uh, theatrically later this month, uh, and then it will be on, I believe, MSNBC. I, might, I hope I'm not misspeaking. Yeah, coming out theatrically from Focus and then on MSNBC. Um, but uh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you, and um, best of luck to both of you. Stay, stay safe and healthy. You, you too. too. You yeah. too. Yeah.